joining us tonight. Um, this is the second presentation in Goulburn Museum's 2021 speaker series. Uh, right, and bye. I'm, I'm really excited to see all of you here this evening. Uh, my name is Anya Barbo, uh, and I'm the education officer at the museum. And I just like to start tonight by acknowledging the land that I'm speaking to you from tonight and which Goulburn Museum occupies. Uh, the museum recognizes that the city of Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples for their valuable past and present contributions to this land. We also recognize and respect the cultural diversity that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples bring to the city of Ottawa. Uh, and tonight, the reason that we have all gathered here, uh, I'm very pleased to have Lori Tannett with us. Uh, Lori is a Perth-based seamstress and costume designer uh, who enjoys merging the look of historical costuming with the comfort of modern clothing. She thinks that using costumes makes the museum experience more real and can give visitors a look into the lives of people of the area highlighted in the museum. So tonight, Lori is going to take us behind the scenes and give us insight into her process for creating historical costumes. I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we turn the floor over to Lori. Uh, the presentation will run for about 30 minutes. And during this time, we're just going to mute everyone's audio to make sure that we can all hear clearly. And we will also be recording this portion of the evening and post the video online for later viewing. If you have a question, feel free to write it out in the chat on, on the bottom of the screen, and we'll do our best to return to it during the Q&A period at the end. Uh, the Q&A will run for about 20 minutes. Uh, and in order to make sure that we have lots of discussion, we will stop recording uh, before we begin the question and answer period. And you're welcome to participate uh, by just typing a comment in the chat, or you can use the raise hand feature uh, and we'll uh, be sure to unmute you so you can ask your question aloud. Uh, and last but definitely not least, uh, I just want to give a big thank you to uh, Goulburn Museum's new summer student, Paige, uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, and she'll be working away in the background, making sure all the tech for this evening runs smoothly. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lori. There you are. Wonderful. Okay, Thanks. looking good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will begin. I'm sure everybody's ready. All right, I've called this the science behind the costume because costumes just don't appear out of thin air. We've got a lot of, of pre-planning to do, a lot of, um, a lot, there's a lot of steps to go through before you get to wear the costume. So the first thing that happens is a venue like the Goldburn or Matheson House or um, a group will, you know, will contact you and they always have an idea of what they want. So I get a phone call or somebody meets me on the street or a friend of a friend says, um, these people need, uh, are interested in some costuming. So we make contact and we have a chat on, on, on the phone about what they're looking for. And I have a think about it. Can I do it? Is it something that I have the time to do? Do I have the resources to do it? Do I have the knowledge to do it? Uh, and then we will have an in-person meeting or in the pandemic, a Zoom meeting where we work on the details. So the first thing we have to look at is what error are we looking at? Because as you can see, there are definite shapes, particularly for women's um, dress. Each era has a distinctive shape. So we want to identify that. 
men are the same. Now they don't change as much, but they do have definite shapes and definite um, dress habits for any particular time or activity. Then we look, you know, we have to discuss what kind of venue you have. What's the purpose of your venue? You know, the Goldburn Museum um, has their own, um, their own focus. Um, they're, they're looking at the oldest military settlement. Um, and so we have um, the semi-military um, shapes going on. I know you have the most wonderful red coat costume in your museum. Uh, but you also were prosper, you know, part of a prosperous town community. Matheson House is all about the Matheson family and their relationship to Perth and what they did in their era were the late 1800s. Smith's Falls has the Railway Museum. Um, they're totally transportation oriented. So if we were to costume them, we'd be looking at conductor's uniforms and working uniforms. And then uh, in Lanark County, there's the Silver Queen Mine, which was about industry, the mining industry in um, Lanark County and how those, how those miners lived. So we, you know, we have to really pay attention to that focus and the kinds of activities that you want to do with that focus. So you might be wanting just a display. Um, this was the Perth Fair in um, the Canada 150. So we just did a costume display at the beginning of the home craft building. These people, and wonderfully dressed, are reenactors and they are almost rabid about their construction. They only use, they only like to use old methods, hand methods of construction. Now, nobody's going to pay me to do that. So I actually have features on my machines that allow me to imitate a handworked buttonhole. Um, and I can, and I do some handwork, but I really try to keep that to a minimum because it's very time consuming. But this woman down here, these shoes she's wearing, which you can't see very well, she couldn't find shoes she wanted, so she actually hand carved her heels and made her shoes. They were wonderful. Okay, this is a school group. So maybe you're doing summer camps and you put the, the kids in costume and you wear costumes and you do things with the, the children that they would have done in that time period. You might be focusing, you might have an event that focuses on a particular period in history, the women, the votes for women, the suffragette movement. And in the Silver Queen mine, this is the bunkhouse. They talk about, they have the characters, and they, they talk about how the, how the cook worked, how the miners lived, and they have bunks, and the costuming is very, very um, basic and worker thing, not workers' costumes, nothing, nothing fancy, but really effective when they're talking about the hardships of rural mining. Then you might get, you might be asked to help with a large group. This was the settlers trek where they walked from Brockville back to Perth for the 1816 um, anniversary of the founding of Perth. And so some people have proper costumes. Some people have put their costumes together from Sally Ann. Um, there's all kinds of degrees, but everybody was in was in the mode they were trying to get the flavor of the costume of the costume and what the people looked at and they lived in those clothes for five days as they walked from from uh, Brockville to Perth it was a tremendous event you also need to know what are your characters do you have a backstory do you want you do want prosperous town people um, who, who kind of ran a business, who ran a company. Um, if you're, you're military, do you want to have the soldiers and do you want the, the soldiers' wives uh, or the women who were supporting the town who often is not were running the businesses? Or do you want the, the, bar, the bar girls? You know, you, you, everybody has a story and you wanna portray that in their costuming. 
you might, everybody has the people who were in charge, the upper class people, um, the people who ran everything, who were in charge. And again, they have a slightly different dress and you want to portray that in the costumes because the costumes give you a subliminal message that you don't even know is there, but it tells, just by looking at them, it tells you a whole lot about that person. So, you know, I think that we do, I mean, we have, there are very many upper class people, but if you look at, at this particular set of costumes, this man was costumed because he wanted to be accurate and he wanted to be a Scot. So he has the accurate shirt, the vest, a kilt, socks. Um, this man, he's just in the flavor of the moment, but he has the good shirt on and the walking stick. And this woman went to Sally Ann and found a black dress, a white apron, she made a bonnet, and she found an old shawl. This man found this perfect vest at, um, at a thrift store, which I think looks wonderful. And these men down here, they're a really good representation of the local militias that sprung up. And so they, they would wear their regular clothes and they'd often have just a jacket or some insignia. And with these guys, they were really attached to those muskets. So then after we've sort of sorted all that, that stuff out, you know, what era, what kind of, what kind of backstory are you using? What's your character? We then have to pick pieces. This is a representation of all the clothing that an upper class 18th century gentleman would wear. So you kind of pick and choose what you want. Shoes are easy. You find a shoe that has the right look and you just use a modern shoe. These are fall front pants. Very important that you have that detail in this era. The vests, um, sometimes you can find a vest. Um, you know, sometimes you have to make it this high necked collar, this tailcoat, very important um, feature. Also the tailcoat that I made for Goldberg actually has pockets in the tails because a lot of these pants don't have, a lot of these things don't have pockets. So where do you put your cell phone? Okay. Now women, women have a lot of underwear. So you pick and choose how much of this underwear you wanna wear. Um, it's, it can be heavy, it can be constricting, but it is important because the underwear gives you the distinctive shape that you're after in your clothing. Um, it also allows the, the outer dress to remain fresher because it's a lot easier to wash a chemise and pantaloons than it is to do this whole dress. So where do, I, where do I find the shapes? How do you find the shapes? There's so many resources online, in books. So I went through and I pulled some pictures. This would be a 1700s museum setup, And it's a really nice set of man and woman's dress. This would be 1812, the Regency period. I love this dress because first of all, I love the color, but look at the detail on it. So this would be an evening gown. And then um, the men, the upper class men for their former wealth wear could be incredibly detailed and fancy. So that all of this along here would be embroidery. from the short breeches, the, the um, pants. He still has fall front trousers on, but he has long pants now. He has the, it's called a morning coat uh, because you wore it in the morning and the tail is that split tail is actually, so when you ride a horse, you don't sit on your coat. The tail goes down each side of the saddle and is a little more quite plain, so they're easy to do in modern dress. 
this would be called this would be a woman's day dress, believe it or not. So uh, a woman who ran a fairly large household would wear this all day um, and change for evening, but she uh, and she would be ready to receive visitors. This, I always think, look at this and I think this is a working woman. This is a school teacher. Someone, so a woman has to run a shop. A woman has to work for their living. So she has the high-waisted skirt, a shirt, and a jacket, uh, a jacket on. So she, I call this my school mom. Now, paintings, pastoral paintings are particularly important to look at because you can always find examples of high-end clothing. It's really difficult to find examples of working people's clothing. So paintings are a good source. So if you look, these vests are very important. If For those of you who are connected with um, Scottish dancing or um, pipe bands, this, this particular dress is known as an aboyne. It's the, the laced up vest a skirt of very, these skirts are not particularly full. This one probably is a lot fuller, but it's this vest, this shirt, and this shirt actually is like a second chemise because it's probably quite long and then it goes down underneath the skirt and then an apron to keep your clothes clean. What I particularly like about this painting is, again, you don't get many images of the men. So this boy has on that vest with those distinctive tag, um, tabs on the, on the um, pockets, and he's got the high collar and the shirt that is laced up. I knew I was gonna do that, sorry. <sighs> Okay, so his vest, his vest and pants are how you pull those shapes out. Now, once you've decided all of that, you start looking at patterns. There are some really good patterns out there that make your life simple because you don't have to go adapting patterns or drawing them. And Laughing Moon Mercantile is historically correct. Yeah, a reenactor, could use this because they tell you, they give you the historical background, the shapes are right, and the construction is, is right. Um, I f and their, their, fat, their pattern range is distinctive, it's, it's extensive. You can get a whole lot of errors out of them. If you look, they send, you get a book with the pattern and the book has very detailed construction notes. They also give you historical notes on the back to make, you know, so why, why does it look like that? Why are you doing that? And why was that fabric used? So I found that very interesting. But, but I'm, before the pandemic, we were setting up a very Victorian play, and she, she has drafted out patterns, and she classifies them by time period um, and by shapes. You buy, if you look, the skirt and the bodice are two separate pieces, but underneath that, she's, she pays a whole lot of attention to how to make the underwear, the hoops, the bustles. So a really good resource for that kind of work. Folkwear has been around forever. Now this dress is the one that Murphy's Point uses for their um, Lally Homestead women. This is the classic prairie dress um, worn for years and years. It's actually quite comfortable and easy to make. The thing about folkware, and particularly, is the new owner has decided to size her patterns up to the, the larger sizes because they used to stop at 14, which isn't particularly big nowadays. She's also started um, making her patterns PDF. So you, when you buy them, you don't wait for weeks and weeks for the pattern to arrive. You download it take it to a copy shop and have it printed off 
for yourself. And the, uh, all of these patterns come multi-size. So you buy one pattern and you will have um, seven or eight sizes. So you can just pull off, you know, you trace off the size you want, or if you send it out to the printer, cut the size that you want. They also are very, um, very specific about their measurements. Then there, you know, there's also, these are easy to access. Simplicity McCall's Vogue in their costume sections. They have um, a, a fair few costumes, but they're all modern, uh, modern methods and modern cuts. So they give you the flavor of the piece and the look and the certainly the ease will be will be modern so the, the costume will not be um, will not be as tight fitting or specific as one of the other patterns but they're perfectly acceptable and um, quick and easy to do. Now there's one book that I particularly like. Um, it's called Patterns of Fashion by Janet Arnold. And she went through the Bath Museum and in their collection, she made pictures. And this is a writing habit, all right, from 1790 or 1730. Anyway, she gridded out all the pattern pieces. So you can see what shape these patterns are. Um, I have never made one of these because never wanted to take the time to do the gridding. But one of the reenactors I saw two years ago did, and I was so taken by it, I recognized it immediately. So this woman gridded out that pattern and made this absolutely stunning writing habit for the Sally Johnson days, which are the reenactors meeting in Prescott, Ontario. And they are reenacting the um, American Revolution. So I talked about measurements. Um, there, I, I tend to use, um, particularly if you're, um, if you have a side, if you have a shape that's a bit hard to fit, I will make extensive measurements using this pattern maker software. It gives you very, very specific information about how to measure. Um, so that your measurements are accurate. And then I can take this back into the software if I need to and print out a basic pattern or use one of their macros and print out a basic shirt or a basic pair of pants. And then I lay it over the pattern I'm using and make sure everything fits. And I usually find when I do that, the fit is quite good and it doesn't take a whole lot of, it doesn't take a whole lot of adjusting in the fitting. Laughing Moon sends you, again, a very specific set of measurements they want for their patterns. And if you don't do this, um, it's harder to put their pattern together. So measurement is one of those key things that you need to spend the time on. But if you're just kind of, you're not particularly worried about it, if you're just trying to do um, a flavor or if you're using a simplicity, one of the commercial patterns, using a body like this is a good record of measurements. And sometimes you can go back, sometimes I've had just these measurements and I've gone back and put them in the more intensive measurement um, measurements for the, the specific patterns. Then we get to the fun part. This is the, the part that I really enjoy. We have to pick the patterns. We have to pick the, the patterns we want to live. We have to pick the, um, fabrics we're going to use, the color schemes. And this particular one, I was working on um, a red serge uh, for a, a pipe band, actually. And we needed exactly the right red. So I was able to get this swatch and this was the red that was right. So that's the fabric we used. This, this quarter's issue of threads has this great article uh, called the dress diary, and a woman found a diary that um, that another woman had kept over sixty years, and every dress in her family she collected samples of the fabrics and little sketches and little stories. A very interesting article, but you can see 
in this dress, she's managed to find fabrics, swatches that are quite close to what's been made here. So it's always good to have, and, and I do place swatches on the measurement sheets, so I remember whose fabric belongs to whom. Sometimes, you know, I, in the beginning, the first big, big, big job I did, I sketched up what we were looking for it's before I even found the patterns. But you can see this man's vest, that's these guys, that's this vest and this shirt, okay? Um, so it, it gives the people an idea about what they're, what they're, look, what they're purchasing, what they've ordered and, you know, hopefully they match when you're done. You can see this is the farm lady, the, the um, camp follower. And you can see this, we did this one for Goldburn and this, I think she looks terrific in this dress and apparently it was easy to move in for her. Again, though, this was the one you saw in the first picture. Another, so we did a big peplum on this one. We did a closer one on this one. Um, another woman wanted the 1816 dress, but not fancy. So she chose a plain fabric with a shirt and the vest. And these little uh, epaulets, these little shoulder extensions were also typical of the period. I always think they just kept the rain off your shirt. Here we have the townswoman or the officer's wife. So we have that, that high-waisted shape in 1816, right here. This woman actually brought me a gunny sack dress. We cut it up, added some velvet, added a different um, bodice to it underneath the jacket, and we made her an 1816 dress. She got a bonnet and trimmed it out, and, and I think her shoes were amazing. She, she had some Mary Jane shoes. They, may, they might be Nyots or, um, you know, so a modern shoe, but it was perfect. This is her husband. And then we have the tailcoat and the vest and the shirt. And he opted for long pants and we didn't, he didn't want fall fronts, so we covered them up. But, um, you know, I think he fits the bill. He looks like that prosperous um, town person, a doctor, a lawyer, professional man. Then we have the deep end costumes for Goldburn. These were historically accurate. They're la the laughing moon patterns. So he's got the fall, the fall front pants with the high waist. He's got the uh, tail jacket. This is the jacket that has the pocket and the tails to hide his cell phone. Um, he's got a vest. He's got the stock and the shirt. Caitlin has the short jacket, which has it's called a police. She's taken her bonnet, made her, her lovely bonnet and put lace on it. And this little detail under here, you often see in historic clothing, this line. And that's put in there because if you wear out the bottom of your skirt, they didn't replace the whole skirt. They just changed the bottom. They put another bottom on. So there's a seam there. And um, I played with prairie points to disguise the scene, but you'll often see that line there. And that's the reason it happened in historic clothing because they would change out that bottom if it became worn or stained. Now we get to the unmentionable subject. Women's underwear and historic clothing are surprisingly important. As I said, they determine the shape that you achieve at the end of your costume. So you can have the costume, but if you don't wear at least some of the proper underwear, then it doesn't, you don't achieve the effect you're looking for. So this collection of underwear. Now, the big, the big question, how did you go to the bathroom in all of these, with all these clothes on? Well, you don't sew up, the, they never did sew up the crotch of the underwear. So the pantaloons with the lace and everything are open on the bottom. You have, um, you have a chemise. Again, this keeps, keeps your dress off your clothing. It also keeps the corset 
off your body so it's a little more comfortable. And you have a hoop and a lot of other stuff, a couple other layers. So let's dress our lady. We start with the chemise and the drawers under here. Um, the bottom two layers, they didn't have bras then. The corset acted as a sort of support for the breasts. Over the chemise, you place the corset. Now the corset is fitted by lacing up the back first. And then when it's set, because you're the only one who wears that particular piece, you then push it together and there are hooks all up and down here. And this is heavily bone front and back, you know, on each side. So it really holds the shape. Now I have worn this corset and it's not as uncomfortable as you might think, although you're um, not bending over from the waist. You, you learn to move in other ways. On top of that, you hang the hoop. Now this was for a bell-shaped hoop. Um, at the time this was made, I didn't have access to whalebone or, or any of the very expensive metal hooping materials that you can get. So I said, okay, this is Lanark County. Now Lanark County in that time, time, and during that time would also not have had access maybe to whalebone or the splits or any of the specialty stuff. So they would have made do maybe with the grapevine, maybe if somebody was a talented woodworker, they might've made their own splits to make the hoop part. Everybody had string or bits of cloth or something to hang the hoops. You tied it around your waist. But in my case, I used fishing, fish tank tubing, and then I inserted fence wire into it. And I was able to bend it into the round shape and it worked. It was, you know, it was a make do thing. And I, I, and I when I did, finally access the right materials. I never have made that hoop because it's always a great story to talk about the make do. Over top of that, you have to, of course, cover that hoop. So you wear a petticoat and women may wear two or three petticoats depending time of year, how much they, how much volume they wanted, how rich they were. Uh, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of reasons they would, but we went with one, just one petticoat. Um, you also might notice that I don't gather. I don't do a lot of gathering, like shearing up the fabric because in my, it gets bulky, but also um, for modern look, we don't like a lot of bulk. So I tend to use small pleats as opposed to gathering to take up all that extra fabric. And I just find it, it lays a little nicer. Then you put the final layer on. Again, you can see it's not gathered, it's pleated. Okay, so this is my, my, my outer, the outer wear for this woman. It's a skirt, which has a, a tall waistband on, has a sh um, shirt underneath. Then you always wear a bodice or a jacket. In addition, she would have a bonnet, gloves, and a purse. And inside the skirt in here, there will be at least one very deep pocket um, for keeping things because they didn't actually um, always carry a lot in their pockets. But sometimes you just needed to have a big deep pocket to maybe keep your hanky, perhaps hide your money, or if you weren't carrying a small purse, everything you had would go in that pocket. Um, I have a theory too about this, about you see these, these wide bell-shaped skirts. I think that the reason that doorways are so wide in old houses is so you can get this hoop through the doorway without hitting the sides. Um, and, and this was the, 18, the 1850 project um, for the Canada 150. So we, um, we had a lot of fun with this dress. So I, that's the end of my presentation. I'll be glad to field any questions you have. I, um, 
I didn't go into sewing because it went, you know, you never photograph yourself while you're actually working, but I can answer some questions about how things are sewn together. And um, I'm open for any comments or questions. So thank you. Thanks very much, Lori. Uh, that very informative presentation. And I'll just make a note that we will now stop recording.